Greetings, uh, welcome to Sector 39. Um, we're warming up for our permaculture design course over the course of this month, uh, being December, and we're going to kick off for really in January. Um, we're exploring, we're learning um, different ways of teaching and trying to improve our online teaching this time because we want to make our we want to make this training as available as we can to as many people as possible. And um, although we're based here in Wales in the UK, we have many friends in East Africa and also in Zimbabwe in the south. And um, and, and also permaculture is, is a global phenomenon. And I think the more we talk and share ideas across the world, the more interesting and powerful, you know, the, the whole experience becomes. So as part of our warm up month, I thought I would do a kind of a, a, an introductory lecture to give you a flavour. Is permaculture for me? Is this something I might be interested in? Um, am I going to be able to follow it? Um, you know, perhaps in another language or, or, or from afar. So here we are. This is your chance to find out. And um, I hope you find this interesting and stimulating. And um, I'm going to try and share with you some introductory thoughts. Um, yeah, so let's see how we go. <clears throat> so this um, intellect introductory lecture is called Learning from Patterns in Nature. Um, I've used, um, used these slides in many different contexts as, as an introduction to get people thinking. And yeah, um, I'm going to sort of improvise a bit around this. And I hope you find this interesting. So <clears throat> permaculture originates from really um, asking some fundamental questions back in the 1970s in Australia, it so turns out, uh, from a guy who was a forester. And he saw in his lifetime a significant erosion into, you know, into the natural world in, in Australia, in Tasmania. And, and, and it, he it made, made um, Bill Mollison um, think some very fund fundamental thoughts about Sort of like the sustainability of our economy and, 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 and could we do it better or how else might we approach this? And I think one of the starting points for this process is to ask ourselves the question, what can we learn from observing nature? So in the light of um, Bill's experiences, I thought we'd start in the forest. This slide is taken at uh, Mabira Forest in Uganda, central Uganda. It's equatorial rainforest. And sadly, it's being um, uh, uh, clear, uh, felled and, and cleared at a, an alarming rate. But still, it is in a very important uh, habitat, biodiverse habitat. And a reminder of the fantastic potentials of this landscape. So, Let's think about these wild natural forests, especially the sort of equatorial belt forests, something which we've eroded into very heavily. Um, <clears throat> but that, this is nature's expression. Nobody necessarily planted these trees. No one had a design in mind. Nobody, um, you know, set about with intention of creating this landscape. It's, this is what nature does left to itself. So I think our first lesson is to be reminded that left to its own devices, nature's fine. It doesn't need us. It's more the question about how we fit into these relationships. So we're seeing <clears throat> the conversion of sunlight into stored forms of energy. Everything needs breakfast, uh, I like to say. Um, everything needs an input of energy in some form. And 
the way I look at this, and I think this is an important way of thinking about it, is the only new energy coming into the system, coming into our planet, is coming from the sun. And only plants, pretty much, only plants can convert the energy in that sunlight into sugars and starches and carbohydrates and stored forms of solar energy and literally all plants do is they use the energy of the sun to join together water and carbon dioxide molecules together to form these more complicated chains of carbohydrates now don't worry too much about the scientific terms or chemical names uh, unless you're particularly interested, of course. Don't let that be a barrier. Really, we're talking about a combination of air and water with the energy of sunshine to create life. And of course, as the forest develops, so does that create niches, habitats, opportunities for other species to find their place within that system. Now, I happen to know from being in Mabira Forest, I think there's 200 species of birds, you know, just unique to this place, 100 species of butterflies. There's, you know, monkeys and, oh, I don't know, so many different elements within the forest system. So it's not just plants. But one of our key starting ideas in permaculture is, well, if it's only plants, really, that can convert sunlight into stored forms of energy, then every other living being, every living creature, every other living thing has to build a relationship to plants to get their food, to get their energy. So maybe one of our first ideas is to realize that it's all about relationships. It's all about interconnections. And that seems to be one of a fundamental theme throughout our observations of nature. Nothing exists in isolation. Um, so maybe our first pattern is seeing the pattern within the forest. When we look at any individual element within natural systems, we see another layer of patterns. Now this is a cactus. And what we're seeing here is the Fibonacci spiral. Um, something which we will talk about in more depth uh, within the PDC. But it turns out that <clears throat> this pattern is the optimal way to arrange elements together to be able to sort of fit as many into a space in a functional way. <clears throat> so there's also, we're seeing evidence of evolution everywhere when we look into nature. Because in the fullness of time, Random selection, random mutations have, have, have tried at every single permutation. And it's the ones that function the best that are promoted and go forward. So we might not know what it's teaching us. We might not know what it really means. But when we look into nature and we see these patterns, we can be sure that what we're seeing is something that's consistent, um, something to me that is um, significant. And these same patterns crop up again and again and again in different circumstances. So again, there must be something interesting and relevant about that. So here we're still looking at another cactus and we're seeing individual florets within that cactus. And what fascinated me about this, and I think that, so nature creates these patterns and it does it again and again and again. However, when we look at this, we realize that each one of these florets is ever so slightly different. There's slightly different sizes and shapes. Um, and that's just worth, again, thinking about a little while is, what is that telling us? Is these forms are generated, the same genetics, the same components, the same uh, chemicals and minerals, the same processes are happening, but each one forms to be slightly different. And again, that's another theme we see when we observe nature. It's 
every individual is different, even if it's an expression of the same you know, set of genes, the same same processes. And, and that's because there's a kind of a unique set of circumstances unfolding as each one of these florets forms. Um, maybe slightly different presence of bacteria, or sunlight and shade or humidity or wind or interactions with other species. Um, so as the plant expresses, the genes express themselves and create these forms, they are modified and shaped by the environment they're part of. And that's the next thing I think we could, hmm, don't really know what that's, what I'm learning from that, but that's significant and interesting. And let's file that away again and, and see that <clears throat> these are things which are gonna come to life as we explore further into this sort of permaculture concept. Nature as our teacher, we're simply observing and asking questions. Why is it like that? What can we learn from that? This is an acacia tree, um, thorny, hardy, scrub, pioneer tree. I do believe it is also a legume, which means it has root nodules where specific bacteria exist, um, which trade nitrogen that the bacteria can access in return for sugars from the tree. So again, we're seeing how nature's built on relationships and two-way relationships. Um, but these relationships can start becoming very complex. So we have this notion of symbiosis, uh, which is a mutually beneficial relationship. And I think this is a central and very important lesson in permaculture is to seek out and build and define mutually beneficial relationships. So there's a whole lot of other things going on here. And um, this was taken in a, in a, a national park in the northwest of Uganda a few years ago, uh, Murchison Falls. And the tour guide uh, pointed out to me, he said, look to that tree and can you see those little balls, those little, we would call them galls here in the UK. Um, they're little spherical structures on the end of the branches and twigs of this tree and of course yes I, I said I can see them and I recognize them because we have similar things happen here in the UK there's a little grub that lays its um its eggs in the buds of oak trees here and instead of that growing into um into more tree it, it, it creates a spherical ball in which the larvae hatch and contains the nutrition for them well, it's very much the same thing is going on here. Um, I believe it's a termite has laid its eggs in the bud of the acacia and that's allowed it to access the sugars within there and to form this gall, which is the insect interacting with the genetics of the tree to get the tree to produce a structure that favors the insect. <clears throat> and again, this is also affecting the energy of the tree. So here's, here's the thing that we need to bear in mind. It's a very important point. Is, uh, so plants generate sugars. That's basically what they do. And to be able to access anything else, minerals and other functions and things that they need, they use those sugars to trade. So you could try and think of this, um, this tree as something that's generating sugars which it is using strategically to further its own development so here's an interesting way so the first way we've talked about it is the tree will be um, photosynthesizing uh, joining carbon dioxide and water molecules together using the energy of the sun creating sugars and some of those sugars maybe 30 to 40 percent of that generated by the tree are pushed down into its roots where it gives off those sugars um, as exudates, they seep into the soil and it attracts and feeds the beneficial bacteria and mycelium, fungi, 
um, that help the tree establish and grow. And some of the sugars is exchanging with the rhizobium bacteria, which is bringing nitrogen to the tree and in the process helping develop the soil that the tree is going in, growing in. <clears throat> so right there we have a mutually beneficial relationship. But the next thing that's happening is the tree is actually content to give up some of its sugars also to feed the termites. So what's the payback? Why, why would the tree do that, if you like? Um, if it's a, what, what's the benefit back to the tree? Well, the answer is, of course, this tree is the favorite food of the giraffe. And giraffes are voracious feeders. They have long prehensile tongues. They can quickly strip the leaves from a young tree and they might even prevent it from, from growing and developing. Were it not for the termites, they immediately sense the presence of the giraffe and they stream out of their little galls and they've got glands on them. They can squirt out formic acid, which would sting the mouth of the giraffe and encourage it to move on to the next tree. So basically what happens is the tree's prepared to give up a small part of its foliage to feed the giraffe, but that is regulated by the action of the termites. And of course, in the process of feeding on the tree, the giraffe is going to help promote promote the uh, acacia tree by distributing its seeds through its droppings and they might stick onto its fur or onto its coat or something like that. So what we're seeing here is, a, is this very intimate relationship between the tree, the termite, the bacteria and the giraffe. And in permaculture way of thinking, we'd call that a guild. We'd say, all of those elements, those different um, partners in this in this relationship are contributing to the overall health of you know, the system that they're part of. So symbiosis, guilds of species, mutually beneficial relationships. These are the lessons that come tumbling out of, of, of nature when we observe it. So all of this might help us think a little bit more about how we can learn from nature. Succession. So what here is, is a tiny little pool of water and it's on top of an enormous rock boulder. Again, I took this in Uganda. And where some water trapped in this depression, some seeds are blown in, maybe some bird droppings delivered those seeds and they've germinated. And we can see a couple of different kinds of plants, two or three different kinds of plants that uh, have uh, germinated and are now growing in this little crevice. Um, they might just live and die in a short space of time, but even if that's the case, they might dry out and leave um, your dead organic matter, which will break into compost, which starts creates a bit more soil, which then enables that little crevice to absorb and hold more water, and then for life there to develop. So even without anybody doing anything, we can see how nature, uh, maybe just through random seeds moving around by the wind, by birds, by other animals, um, or can colonize new places and start a succession, which might move from a few very simple plants over time to something that looks a bit like Mabira forest. So let's think about nature, not as a static thing, as a dynamic thing. And we can also wonder how we might be able to utilize these processes in our own uh, relationships with nature. Um, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. These are our first thoughts. Succession. So in different countries and different climate zones, we'll see different plants. But those, the plants that we see in those different countries might still be recognizable to us because they're still performing the same kind of function. So this picture is from North Wales, where, where I live, much colder. Um, this is higher, it's about a thousand feet up in the hills. And we're looking at a, at a very poor, degraded landscape, which has been dominated by this spiny prickly plant. You can see it there in the in the panel, the, the spikes, very, very sharp and uh, 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 defensive and also on the right um, you can see it flowering these lovely yellow flowers now 
If you were to observe closely and you look at those flowers, their shape and structure is very much the same shape and size of that you'd um, shape and of, of, the, of flowers you might see on other plants, like beans and peas, other members of the legume family. So isn't that interesting that we saw a spiky uh, <clears throat> pioneer plant in, in um, Murchison Falls in Uganda? <clears throat> and here we're seeing a spiky pioneering nitrogen fixing plant in North Wales. And it's really doing the same job. Um, it's spiky and spiny because it's actually very nutritious and it's protecting itself from grazing animals. And actually the very tip of this plant is when it's growing is soft and animals will nip, nibble the ends <clears throat> but it very quickly becomes hard and woody so um that prevents the again prevents the gra grazing animals uh browsing animals from taking too much from dam damaging the plant um now i'm telling you about this particular examples and you can see in the picture that we've got some sheds and we've got some raised beds and this is indeed a, a little community garden. And I was thinking when I saw this, I was thinking about pioneering plants that slowly build habitat, increase soil quality. And then it made me think about pioneering people who've spotted the opportunity. The gorse here has built soil where there wasn't soil before. They've harvested that gorse, that's the name of this plant. They've composted it. And they, using raised beds on contour, they've built up soil quality and they've been able to begin growing. So when we think about succession in plants, simple plants where we enable um, and create habitats for more complex plants to come along, that can happen with people too. We, there are pioneers and there are those that follow on and there are the, those that maybe help establish existing uh, 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 projects and ventures and um and there's maybe other people that would only join something when it's already fully mature so we can think about the role that we might play within succession are we someone who starts things off or maybe helps establish things or helps finish things um you think about how um all these different plants but also different people might contribute to this overall process now, <clears throat> I'm not going to dwell on all of these because each one of these slides is a really long and complex story. Um, but they're all, um, if you like, a beginning of our exploration into permaculture. So what, <clears throat> what we're seeing here is we can see at the top of the picture there is a village. We're obviously in the mountains. It looks very, very steep. And we're seeing some houses that look like they're made out of local and natural materials. But know that below that we are seeing terraced fields that have many trees in them. Those trees are all they've got little white flowers on them. They're coming into blossom, and I can tell you that they are all plum family trees. So apricots and plums and stone fruits. And this is actually in Morocco in the High Atlas. And what we're seeing here is how. Over many, many years, this community has, through succession, has built soil on otherwise uh, steep and, uh, and, and dry land and given a chance to um, hold on to water to prevent rainfall from leaving the system too quickly and from there developing their orchards. So a few thoughts when I see this is isn't it interesting how the settlement is at the top of the of um of the of, of the of the of the system and then we see the fields below and then there's the riverbed below that so when it rains that rainfall is going to hit the houses and the, the 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 buildings and the roads of the settlement and unless not care unless it was carefully managed that water would rush downhill open up um, ravines and uh, erosion gullies and and leave the system very quickly um, so instead what the farmers there have done is that they've built a system that very cleverly 
catches and stores that rainwater. They make it go sideways. Using the terraces and banks and ditches, they slow down the passage of that water so that it nourishes the landscape. And then that gives them a chance then to build their farming systems. So everything that I observed when I visited this system was that it, it felt like there was a constant interaction between the community of people and the landscape. They're constantly making small changes and modifications, what we like to call tweaks, uh, um, to, to, to modify the system and to optimize it. So think about how over time, people might have made lots of little minor adjustments to make this system work. And now that it's established, it's clearly highly productive and successful. Again, just a glimpse and insight. Um, um, uh, we'll, we'll look at these things in much more detail on the course. But here's some of our first observations. Uh, this is within the orchard. Many interventions are made to help slow down the passage of water. Look around the base of each tree. Even there's being excavated um, like a little bowl. And in that bowl is leaf matter, organic matter. Again, that might absorb and hold rainfall and help uh, slow down the passage of water and help contribute to building soil. The same way as we saw in, in the earlier photo, but um, yeah. Again, we can just see into the system and how, how perhaps it might be working. And again, um, we can think about, the, we'll think about these things in a bit more detail. So, I've been inspired by ideas, um, systems that I've seen maybe in other places, in other countries, whether it's different parts of the UK or there in Morocco or, or, or in Uganda or anywhere else. And taken those ideas and then applied them here in the UK in a way which meets, understands our climate system and our available resources. And I think we can all learn lessons from each other and we can translate those lessons to, to fit our own needs and requirements. Uh, this lovely picture was drawn by uh, a permaculture student uh, many years ago, back in 2010 now, um, visualizing a small community garden plot that we, were, uh, what we, we wanted to build at the time. And in fact, this illustration was part of an overall design which was very successful and went ahead and which I got five years of work out of. So, uh, um, yeah, we can create opportunities for ourselves and our communities with by working with these really quite simple ideas and but being consistent over time so that we can build our own systems. So look, here's the visualization of it. Here's an actually more um, detailed map of how the garden might look and Actually, this is another garden, a different one, but we can, for, for the purposes of our imagination of this discussion, we can think about how ideas move from the abstract to drawings and plans to becoming an actual reality in the world. And you think about that's a design process, isn't it? That we've, that whoever has involved, been involved with this, they've used their creativity and imagination um, they'd maybe looked around to see what resources available and what the potentials of that situation might be. They've come up with an accurate plan and, and then they've begin to implement that plan and allow that implementation to inform them. So permaculture gardens might look very different in different places, but they are um, informed by the same kinds of ideas. Okay, so this is um, an interesting photo, beautiful landscape. This is on the Isle of Anglesey, Anismon in Welsh. It's, it's in North Wales. And yeah, it's a beautiful landscape, um, obviously coastal. Um, but what we're seeing is a landscape with no trees, a landscape with very little diversity, um, a landscape that has been totally shaped and formed by the grazing patterns of sheep and uh, we produce a, we do a lot of sheep grazing in North Wales and it's an important part of the economy and of course it's a it's a very good source of food 
but it's had in, over time it's had an enormous impact on our landscape and it shaped the landscape simplified it and um i see it as a it's gone too far in one direction um we've lost the diversity of species you know this does not look like mabira forest this is, does not look like a landscape that's regenerated and is complex it looks like a landscape that is being slowly eroded away now permanent grassland can build up good soils and so forth but i'm also suspicious that we're seeing especially these light brighter green fields have been fertilized and again that comes at an impact on the um the the the, the life the soil biota the life within the soil and um over time if that's not addressed those soils will break down so here's a complete contrast to that. This is a landscape in East Timor, which is an island um, between Australia and Indonesia. Um, again, where there's been a lot of erosion and um, I, I don't know many, I, 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 uh, well, also many challenges, no doubt. Um, and look here how in this really wonderful complex drawing, um, we can see how water has been captured and managed to a series of ponds um, right the way through the system so that different yields can be obtained i'm seeing fish and ducks and um, poultry um, and and then the water being used perhaps that water is now loaded with nitrates from the fish and then that water is then being used to, to water um, orchards and we're seeing down the bottom of the hill really highly organized and tense vegetable gardens. I think with my permaculture eye, what I'm seeing about this, um, this, this, this farm here is it's very much a system. We've got some very separate elements. We've got the pig pen, we've got the fish ponds, we've got looks like a rice paddy and different things, but they're all connected. They're connected by the flow of water, they're connected by the flow of nutrients, and they're connected by the management of the community with it. I'm also seeing this structure down in the foreground, which maybe that's a classroom or community building where people can learn, come and learn and study the system and also help maintain it whilst they're doing that. So what we're seeing here is sort of the opposite of the previous slide where we've just got one yield we've just got sheep and grass there's nothing else going on here or very very little else this system we've got so much complexity we've got slow down movement of water we've got many many interactions between all the different elements and we've got a huge diversity of yields pigs chickens fish rice fruits fruit trees bananas um and then the education and learning, and then around, I think we see poultry and uh, 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 vegetable gardens and green leaves and, and, and main crops and so many different things all woven together. This is much more like a natural system. This is much more like the web of complexity that we might find within Mabira Forest. And I'd also argue that within this system, there's plenty of space left for wildlife. Uh, wild animals can move through here. Um, there's plenty of nesting sites and places for reptiles and, and, and insects to do what they need to do. And all of those elements we have to value and include in our designs, not just think of the ultimate yield. Only thinking sheep in this picture, where here we're thinking about many, many different aspects. And this is much more in line with the permaculture concept. So I can many I can tell many stories about uh, projects that I've had a hand in, had a chance to learn. This is a community garden um, just down the road from me in in, in Wales. Uh, we called it Kai Bodvach, uh, named after a local um, uh, estate. It's after it's named after a, 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 a big house in parkland, um, and we designed an orchard and chose different elements to go within that orchard to help establish uh, trees in what had been a pasture and um, over time creating a diversity of habitats, diversity of yields, 
um, chance for people to learn and interact, of course. And slowly, slowly, a landscape emerges that has many different, has, has these kind of differences and diversities built into it, as opposed to the, the monoculture that we saw before. So, and we, with this particular garden, we'll be able to go back um, each year over about four or five years and install different elements. So this is a herb garden with a living willow dome in it. And the idea was to create a space that might encourage people, people from the community to come in and get involved and, 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 and maybe a place for children to play and, 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 and interact with the space. So we've thought a bit about guilds. We've thought about, just thought about how different elements might fit together in a system to create something that's more stable and beneficial. Well, here's, here's, my, here's me with a group of colleagues. This is from a few years ago now, um, creating a guild of people. And the Kumhari um, Collective, a uh, group of people committed to uh, regeneration, and teaching and growing food and, and taking on different projects. And I think my final slide is just, um, this is a small shop. Um, I'm actually teaching uh, to you from the room up above the shop or behind it um, and this is our little home in 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 Wales and we're a cooperative so we're, again we're a guild of people of enterprise um, working together to create yeah diversity but to also to build a system that will nourish us and those around us so there you go there are just a few um introductory thoughts and a little bit of insight into um into some of the work that we that we have a hand in so i hope you enjoyed that and i hope you find it useful and give me some feedback tell me how this was am i speaking too quickly can you understand me are the images clear are you getting the right points let me know let me know very keen to uh, i'll post this on facebook i'll post it in a couple of places and do um do give me some feedback Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for listening.